husband, Russell, is an artist. And I am May, and I have an interest in true crime. We decided to merge our two interests together. Enjoy this calming visual while listening to a tragic story. This is Stuart and Crime. Two teenage boys were on their way to a man's house to murder him. One of the boys, Lester Weber, who was 18, felt he really had no choice as his boss, Helen Cundiff, suggested he kill this man just a day earlier. So, here they were, driving to Brian Stout's house on the evening of June 18th, but their car broke down. Undeterred, the boys called for someone to pick them up and drive them the rest of the way to the Stout home. While approaching the house, they saw a police car coming down the road, spooking Lester and the other boy, causing them to call off their plan and drive back to the grocery store. The driver and other teenager dropped Lester back at the grocery store, where he in turn called Mrs. Cundiff to inform her he could not go through with the plan and to please come and pick him up. She picked him up and decided enough was enough she would carry out this murder herself. Why was this woman, Helen, so determined to kill Brian Stout, a 42-year-old art supply salesman? Well, for a love affair, but not hers. She was willing to kill for her friend Mary, who happened to be married to Brian, but was also having a passionate affair with a police officer named John Singletary and was also married with two young children. Helen Cundiff and Mary Stout were good friends, and it was through her grocery store that Mary and John crossed paths in March 1972. Mary described their first meeting as casual, and that Helen mentioned to her afterward that John was interested in her. And for the next three months, from March through June, Mary and John met frequently, about 20 times, according to Mary Stout, but that it was only on 10 occasions where we could have personal conversations, she said. But she denies having that type of relationship with John. Even though for those 10 meetings, the pair often used a friend, Pamela McDougald, apartment while she was at work. Then in April, John professed his love to Mary, which shocked her. She was quoted as saying, I didn't know how to handle it. I went blind. I think I answered by saying thank you very much. It was a casual comment. And many love letters were sent between the two, with John stating in one, he had a desire to die rather than lose her affection. These passionate encounters are what led up to the night of June 18th, 1972. After Helen picked up Lester from the grocery store, she brought the 18-year-old back to her house where she was having a party. This is the account of Pamela, who was a guest at the party, invited by Mary. Pamela explained that she first saw Lester at the party at 10.45 p.m., with Helen stating Weber's truck had broken down and she had to go and pick him up. A little later, Helen announced she was going to take Weber home, and the two left. Then at 12.30 a.m. on June 19th, Pamela watched, the door slammed, and I saw Helen and that fellow, Lester Weber, coming in the house through a glass door. Weber was helping hold a handkerchief to her mouth. She looked very upset. I asked her whether there had been an accident, and she said, Yes, almost. Pamela then saw Helen, Lester, Mary, and John all go upstairs where they remained for about 45 minutes. Next, I will detail Lester's account of that same time frame. After Helen picked him up from the grocery store, she brought him back to her house where John Singletary was waiting for them. 
Helen asked John for his gun, and he handed it over to her. And then Lester left with Helen, driving her to the Stout residence. They made one stop on the way so Helen could buy some cotton and ammonia. Lester waited outside in the car and listened to the radio while Helen went inside the home. Lester then heard six shots and then saw Miss Cundiff come back outside saying, I killed him. I've never done that before. The ammonia did not work. I had to shoot him. The two people's accounts I just explained would end up becoming the star testimony and witnesses for the prosecution. The police showed up at the Stout House after the shooting to find Mary and Pamela standing outside where they described Mary as being unemotional. Mary and Pamela were well known to police for their involvement as lay officers in the police department's Operation Get Involved program. Police need public partners. The crime rate in many cities and towns is still on the increase. However, some areas have shown a steady decline. Efficient police work is a major factor in the reduction, but substantial credit must be given to those citizens who have taken a direct interest in the crime problem. Through Operation Get Involved, many police departments have sought to make the average citizen more acutely aware that crime is a community problem. What can the average citizen learn from Operation Get Involved? You can learn how to protect your family and property from lawlessness and how to cooperate with the police and what suspicious persons and events to report. Through this cooperation, the public serves as the police department's eyes and ears to increase their efficiency. Doesn't it make good sense to be a partner with the police? That was a flyer from the police introducing this new program created by Police Chief Frank Dyson in 1970 called Operation Get Involved. According to the Dallas News, this program has been the subject of inquiries by law enforcement agencies in other cities, but it has also received praise from a nationally known foundation as one of the best organized and most innovative community relations programs in the country. The program was successful in helping to reduce the number of major crimes by 18% in its first year. This program idea was then adopted by other police departments in Texas, all a little different and with different names. They used engraving tools to write the owner's driver's license number on their stuff, so when burglars stole things, and tried to sell them, they would get caught and the owner would easily get their stolen property back. Operation Pink utilizes the cartoon character Pink Panther, but it actually stands for Personal Identification Number Keeper. This was created by the Fort Worth Police Department. The Waco Police Program was called Help Fight Burglars. The Temple Police Program was called Theft Guard. An Austin Police Program called it Operation Identification. Although Mary and Pamela worked with Operation Get Involved, they were asked to resign in September 1971. As many anonymous tips were coming in to police, at that time about the number of frequent police visitors to the Stout residence, quote, at all the wrong hours. This led to the Stout residence being placed under police surveillance for about a week. Then the Stout home was placed off limits to all policemen. In the hours after Brian Stout's death, John was called into his supervisor, Lieutenant James Wood's office, and was told to stay away from the Stout's home, either on or off duty. On June 23rd, Wood turned over a report to the police chief, Frank Dyson, about John's relationship with the Stouts. The following day, five people were arrested. Mary Stout, John Singletary, 
Helen Cundiff, Lester Weber, and Pamela McDougald. John, being a police officer, was the most dramatic arrest as he was arrested at his desk in the Dallas Police Department's Traffic Division. He was then walked over to the Homicide Division squad room, where he was met by a Justice of the Peace, Joe B. Brown, who accepted the murder charges and read John his rights. John was then escorted to the next room, where he was stripped of his badge and uniform, and that was then replaced with a white jail uniform. His wife and mother of his two children wept as she left the police department after being told of the charges brought against her husband. The day of the murder, John gave his pistol to the police ordinance department, complaining that the barrel was crooked and got a replacement. This is why, when the police tested his gun, it was not a match to the bullets found at the crime scene. But after learning of this news, they tested his old revolver and found it to be a match and the murder weapon used to kill Brian Stout, who had been shot once in the side and five times in the back. A month after the shooting, a mysterious letter showed up to the police department, signed, The Eagle. In this letter, the person accused 37 policemen of being a part of a sex and drug parties at the Stout residence, and about Brian Stout's murder. Chief Dyson called this letter an attempt to slur the Dallas Police Department, but he did admit Outside of working hours, officers did visit the residence, but we have not been able to conclude why. This did, however, lead him to question 29 people, including 17 policemen, about the activities at the Stout home. Dyson did say there was one statement that was proven true in the seven-page letter. That Singletary had been there, the Stout's home, on three occasions. We confirmed that, he said. He also said he believes the reason for so much police presence at the Stout home was in connection to Operation Get Involved. In an editorial written in July 1972, titled Strange Evidence in a Rare Case, Chief Dyson is called out even though everyone mostly revered him. In this editorial, they wrote... Generally, we have tried to uphold Dyson, because he has an unusual and open approach, found in very few big city police departments. Also, in spite of this case, he has a department better than most of the city organizations. If Dyson can keep this statement sold to the public and news media, he is rarer than we have ever thought. It is strange evidence that proves some number of men, in this case 37, were not involved in sex and drug activity at the deceased man's house. Yet, the evidence does not provide the same certainty of proof as to just how many off-duty officers were involved in something else at the same address. Pamela and Lester had turned state witness and were not put on trial. They were to testify at the merged trial of John Singletary, Mary Stout, and Helen Cundiff. But the day before trial was to begin, in November 1972, the judge separated the trials. John and Mary would start their trial the next day, but Helen would have her trial pushed back to January 1973. The trial for the couple had an all-male jury with the key point for the prosecution being, we expect to prove there was a very toward love affair going on between this married woman, Mrs. Stout, and this married man, Singledary, even though they weren't married to each other, even though they had children at home, said Prosecutor Stoffer. The prosecution had a pretty easy case with testimony from Helen, Lester, and Pamela along with some witness testimony, such as Barbara Pierce 
who made it a point to say she and Mary were not friends. She told the jury she had seen John and Mary together frequently, often as many as four times a day, and that she had witnessed an incident where Brian came home to find John's car parked in his driveway. He, meaning Stout, took his car and pushed John up against the house. Then he parked, so John couldn't get away. Mrs. Pierce also told of bad feelings between Mrs. Cundiff and Brian Stout, relating that Helen stated Brian was two-faced and a queer and trying to get her husband. Another story she shared was when Helen told her there were rumors going around that she had hired teenage boys to burn Stout's house. She said she didn't have to hire kids to do it. She said she knew professionals she could hire, if she wanted to. Another witness for the prosecution was Buddy Hellenhausen, a friend of the Stouts for six years and was a former Dallas policeman who was now a restaurant owner. In his testimony, he spoke about how Mary was a frequent customer in his cafe, but that in May, a month before Brian's death, she asked Buddy if he could find someone to kill her husband for $500. Believing she was kidding, he did not report this conversation until he saw the news of Brian's death and then contacted the police with that information. The prosecution rests. Mary took the stand in her own defense, but John did not. Yet his wife did get up and testify. Both women denied the affair, with Mrs. Singletary stating, A lot of people said a lot of things. I don't believe them and will not believe them. The defense also tried to prove that Mary and John had no reason to conspire to have Brian killed as he suffered from a rare blood disease. The primary witness for the defense was Dr. Turner A. Wood, who testified that at one point in 1968, Brian Stout was given only 24 hours to live. Let me stop for a second and tell an interesting side note. The ammonia that Helen stopped to get before the murder was because it was believed to be deadly when the substance encountered someone with Brian's rare blood disease. And why she had yelled, It didn't work. I had to shoot him, to Lester. But during the cross-examination, prosecution got the doctor to admit that at the time of his death, Brian's blood count was normal and that he appeared to be completely recovered from his disease. The defense rests. The jury deliberated for one hour and 35 minutes, with a sentence of guilty for both Mary Stout and John Singletary. The two were shocked by this news, with John quoted as saying, I can't believe it. I had stunned feelings. I just couldn't believe it. They said I was guilty of something I didn't do. Mary stated how she didn't understand how the jury could come to that decision. If they had just listened to my testimony, as she trailed off in shock, the two would find out their sentence in a couple days. During this time, however, a juror who was a building contractor named W.K. Vines, came forward explaining he got an anonymous call asking him to consider probation for the couple and asked if he would be interested in some building contract bids. He told the judge this would not affect his decision, and the case went on as planned. Mary and John were both sentenced to 25 years in prison. The next trial would be for Helen Cundiff to start in January 1973, but Helen decided to hire on a second attorney, Representative Bob Hendricks. And because Mr. Hendricks was a Texas representative, this meant that Helen's trial had to be pushed back at least six months 
according to Texas law. This law is called pass law, which allows lawyers who also are legislators to claim such a continuance for cases in which they are involved at the time of a legislative session. The trial of any legislator's client must not be later than 30 days before the legislator goes into session or until 30 days after the session ends. The Texas legislator happened to be going into session on January 9th. Charles Tesmer, who had been Helen's attorney since her arrest, explained the reason they hired on Representative Hendricks was because Ms. Cundiff thought she needed additional counsel. And of course, this will delay the trial until all the bad publicity generated by the trial of the other two dies down. He added that Hendricks would actively participate in the trial. This outraged lawyer Henry Wade, the lawyer I discussed in last week's episode, who did an exclusive interview with KDFW TV Channel 4, saying that Tesmer was trying to delay Mrs. Cundiff's trial until 30 days after the current legislative session that ends in four months. Wade urged that the judge make the decision on whether this law was being abused in this particular case. Tesmer replied back, saying Mrs. Cundiff hired Hendricks without any urging from him, and that she was entitled to employ any lawyer she wanted for her defense. Helen Cundiff's trial was moved to July 1973. The prosecution argued that Helen killed Brian herself after trying and failing twice to have him killed. Going on to say in his opening remarks that Brian Stout had thrown Mrs. Cundiff out of his home and told her never to come back. And although Brian remained good friends with her husband, Helen Cundiff isn't the kind of woman you can tell that to without serious consequences. Next to testify was a curious witness choice for the prosecution, Reva Luttrell, a neighbor of the Stouts. Part of her testimony is as follows. When asked who she saw leaving the Stout house the night of the killing, Reva replied that the person looked to be wearing trousers rather than the long cocktail dress worn by Helen Cundiff that evening, and that the person did not have a high hairdo like Mrs. Cundiff, going on to say, I just assumed it was a man. I couldn't really tell. She was next asked by the prosecution if she might have confused trousers with the long dress Helen wore. She replied, No, there's no way I could get the two mixed up. Both Pamela and Lester testified at Helen's trial of the events that took place that night and the timelines I discussed toward the beginning of this episode. The defense did not call any witnesses, but Tesmer spent a large amount of time cross-examining Lester. Helen Cundiff was found not guilty of the murder of Brian Stout. Yes, you did hear that correctly. Helen was found innocent and acquitted of all charges. In October 1973, Mary Stout was granted a new trial and was released from jail. The judge agreed with the defense arguments that Mary had been convicted on insufficient evidence and also because of misconduct by prosecutors. Prosecutor Henry Wade said he wasn't sure if Mary would be retried in this case, stating, It would be difficult to try her if we don't get some new evidence, and at this late date, it will be hard to find. I could not find any evidence of there being a retrial for Mary Stout, meaning she probably only spent one year in jail for this crime. John Singletary was not granted a new trial, and from what I know, he served out his full sentence. If you enjoyed this video, 
please hit the like and subscribe button below. If you want to inquire about a commission, you can email Russell at russellstuart.art at gmail.com. You can watch Russell live stream his art on Twitch. And if you want to hear more true crime stories, you can subscribe to my podcast, Crimes of a Decade, a Texas true crime podcast. Now that we are done, make sure to wash the brush. Just beat the devil out of it.